on to the morning huddle. Um, we're going to be talking today about our blended family and our blended cultures. Um, and I, I think what we ought to do first, uh, I'm going to call you by your handle, my mommy spouse. Uh, I, th I think what we ought to do is first talk about our cultures and, and you know, what they are, what they mean to us. Why don't you start? Tell us about your culture. Well, I, um, my culture, well, my parents are Middle Eastern, so I am Middle Eastern. I, my mom is Jordanian, my dad's Palestinian. I was born here, but we grew up in um, the Middle Eastern influence and culture. And I lived it through them. So at, they immigrated here, you know, my mom immigrated here when she was about 15 years old, and my dad um, I think he was, I think he was in his 20s, I'm not sure. Um, so they immigrated here and they were old enough to still remember and understand their language, their culture, their food, their traditions. And so they passed that on to us in the household. Um, in the household, we only spoke Arabic. Um, we only could respond in Arabic. Uh, we ate uh, traditional foods. My mom cooked traditional foods, and Middle Eastern foods. Um, we uh, would go back home, you know, so we'd go visit Palestine and Jordan when we were younger. And so we were always around that culture. We made uh, like Middle Eastern friends and family that, who then became family around us in our communities. We found them living here in the United States. So I think that just kind of speaks to all the immigrants. They pretty much migrate to their people. They find their people and they kind of create these communities. And so within that, we were able to relate. You know, we go to the mosques. We go to, you know, we celebrate uh, Eid, which is our, you know, pretty much our Christmas um, and, and so forth. So we would celebrate traditions and culture, stuff that we would kind of pass on through culture and traditions onto us. And so we um, were able to experience that through them. Um, when I turned 13, we moved back. I moved back to Jordan. So I lived in Jordan for about six years, and I was able to experience the full uh, tradition and culture of the Jordanian culture. Um, although I thought I was submerged in it while I was living with my parents, you know, in the United States, I thought like. I knew perfect Arabic and I understood it, but I wasn't really fluent because we would speak only to like my mom and dad in Arabic. But when we'd step outside, we'd go to school, we'd, you know, interact with friends, we spoke English. And so when I moved there and, every, and then, you know, Arabic is the first language, um, I was not as fluent as I thought I was. <laughs> um, I had to learn how to read Arabic, write it, and um, just embrace the cultures, different cultures. I got to experience, you know, different things. It's pretty cool. It's pretty eye-opening. But as we got older, you know, my fam my my siblings and I kind of just caught on, latched on to the things that we identified with as within our childhood. Um, as we got older, we really didn't grow up around like cousins or, you know, we kind of just, we didn't have that community. So we only had each other and we just kind of kept whatever traditions that we thought, you know, was important to us. So there's not, there's not a lot of things that maybe perhaps traditional Middle Eastern families have that we do. And I think it's more, we don't necessarily think of tradition, but we necessarily, we, when we think of things or we reference things, we reference it through you know, religion, per se, but not that so much tradition because we didn't have that strong influence as we were getting older. Um, but, you know, we just, it just, I think it's just, I don't know, I think there's more, it, it's a lot, you know, especially being Middle Eastern, there's a lot of different, you know, um, countries within the Middle East, so like the Lebanese and the Egyptians and the Syrians and the Iranians and you know and so forth. So they all compile the Middle East and but they all have different traditions. And so when I talk about my personal experience and my tradition, it, it differs from what a Lebanese person would experience. So I think that's, that's pretty much what I extracted <laughs> out of that experience. I think that's a pretty good explanation. 
No. Um, so let me try to ex explain my background and culture to everyone. Yeah. Um, so my family is originally from Louisiana. Um, and to put some, give some perspective to Louisiana, Louisiana was purchased by America in 1803 through the Louisiana Purchase. Um, however, it was a French country at the time. However, um, they resisted American ways and held on to their French culture, right? Uh, to the extent that they could. Um, and, and that's why today people still speak broken French, we call it Creole. Um, that's why you still have this culture that exists in Louisiana that is unique to, to, to that area. Um, so I'm born out of that experience, right? Um, so Creole, um, many years ago, met the rich white aristocrats, right? These are the people who own slaves. People get confused. They confuse Cajun and Creole, and they're not the same thing. Yeah. And Cajuns were the whites who migrated from Nova Scotia, Canada, to Louisiana. Um, so those are the, the Cajuns. They're, they're the descendants of, of Canadians from, again, Nova Scotia. Um, Creole um, was sort of became and morphed into a mixed race of people, right? So, for example, um, I did a DNA analysis of myself, and I am 55% African, 44% uh, Caucasian, and the rest is Native American, okay? Which is emblematic of Creole people in Louisiana, right? So, yes, uh, if, if you ask me what my race is, I'm going to say black, proud to, proud to say that. But ethnically and culturally, I come out of the Creole experience. Yeah. So that informs who I am. It informs the food I cook, right? The food I like. Um, uh, and, and also just culturally things that appeal to me. So the Creole people, for example, like... Zadiko music, that's our music. And you have to say it that way, Zadiko. Uh, and, and Zadiko dance. So look it up, you guys get a chance, Z-Y-D-E-C-O. Um, and it's very unique and specific to that part of the country. Um, and then we also have our own food, Creole food, uh, which I love. And I'm actually trying to convert, I think, your family uh, to eating Creole food. Or seasoning, right? <laughs> yes. <laughs> but, which we'll talk about in just a second. Um, so, so, so that's my background. You talked about your background. And so we have the melding of these two unique cultures. I think my culture is unique to America. Yeah. There are Creole people around the world, but it has nothing to do with Louisiana. And people confuse the, the two or three or four. Yeah, like the Haitians. Right. right, the Haitians, right. We have nothing to do with the Haitians other than it has a French base in terms of the, in, relative to the culture. Right. Um, that's the only thing that's relatable. Uh, so, you know, Creole people in America is unique to the American experience. And then you have, you know, you talked about your background and that's unique to the Middle East and your father's Palestinian, right? Yeah, my dad's Palestinian. My mom's and your mother's Jordanian. Yeah. Which yeah, all? We which would go to Palestine and just visit all the time. We would visit like my grandma lives there. My dad lives there now, but um, we go like to Jerusalem, and we were there before they put the walls up, so it was a lot easier to, to do that. Um, and now, like post two thousand, when they built the walls, um, it is kind of hard. But as an American passport holder, it's kind of easy to navigate through that. Um, but I still, I think, I think, I've, and I've did my fair share of traveling around the world, and I don't think I'm biased, maybe a little bit, but I think Jerusalem <laughs> is the beautiful, most beautiful city I've ever experienced in my entire life because, for, you know, the ancient history that lies behind it, and it's just breathtaking. There's no, there's no 
like you can't even begin to describe the experience that you get going to Jerusalem and you just for some reason uh, you just feel at home and you know the three the three religions are there and you feel that everybody is one um, and everybody's just it's you know it's a busy market you know you go and so you you enter Jerusalem and then and then you enter and then you go enter the Jerusalem market and you walk through the market and the market is just a bunch of uh, you know fruit stands and retailers and sweets and all this just beautiful things that you will experience with coming derived out of that culture and you just it's just like a you know a co commotion of you know stuff that you would experience at a market and then you go down the stairs and you walk through and you just experience everything everybody's kind of touching everything it's just this part of the experience and then you walk through all the way up you kind of walk all the way up and there's homes built up into like the it goes it goes up into the market and there's homes built under this you know market and then you keep walking you keep walking and then you you hit the church and then you see you know the the mosque the aqsa and then you look behind that and you see um you know the the temple the jewish temple so you kind of see all religious religions coming together and just experiencing that is just i don't know it's very someone said very was like that. To that i don't think there's anything set up like that in the world yeah. Kasha said Poland is like that. So it seems to be very similar. Um, well, well, let me, I'll say one thing and we'll move on to the other part of our discussion. Um, just m more, more to the point about what Creole, what it means to be Creole. Uh, another way to think of it, and I tell people this all the time. Um, my ancestors were enslaved people. They were the slave owners and they were the people who were indigenous to this land. That's what, that's what you know, being Creole means, uh, coming from out of Louisiana, um, to many people. So that is our history. Again, we are black Americans, but our, our, our culture, our, our ethnicity is rooted in a Creole experience. I mean, before, um, before I met you, I didn't really know you guys even existed. I, I right. Heard of Not many people uh, north of the Basin Dixon line know what true Creoles are. So yeah. there I you have it. Like fascinated when you told me your experience. I was like, wait, I had no idea. It's just amazing. So let's talk about our blended family. Yes. Uh, you hear part of it in the background. <laughs> uh, and Noah is. Uh, all mixed up, right? <laughs> so <laughs> I talked about my background and how, how diverse it is. Yeah. Um, so you take that mixed with your culture. Wow, you got Noah. Yeah. <laughs> how do we He's, describe Noah? It's going to be like just so colorful with, you know, all, with both cultures. Um, you know, there's so much going on between the both of our cultures that I think he's going to... I don't know. I think he's just going to be so unique. You know what I mean? Like he's yeah. going to he's going to be relating to certain things with like two different crowds. You know, and, and they're probably yeah. not even going to expect that out of him. They're going to be like, oh, "How do you know that?" <laughs> you know? <laughs> he's going to know how to say "les bon ton roulé," and he's going to know how to say what? He's going to know how to say "les bon ton roulé," and give me something. <laughs> <laughs> Come on, give me something. Oh, He's going to say... Hamdala. <laughs> Aida, come on. Hamdala. Oh, no. Hamdala. Yes. All right. Yeah, so like... we... Okay, I'm, I'm, this is my show. I ask the question. All right, so... <laughs> talk about how this family came together in terms of, you know, what were the challenges of um, I was coming together. And before you answer that question, let me, let me give the audience some statistics. So the average, the average marriage in America lasts seven years. Did you guys know that? Seven years. Okay. One out of, one out of two marriages will end in divorce. 75% of the people who divorce will remarry. Okay. 1,300 
new step families, which is what we have, are forming every day. That's crazy. And over 50% of U.S. families are remarried or recoupled. Over 50% of families are remarried families. That makes sense? And 50% of women, 50% of women will experience a step family, whether as a child or as a mother. 50% of women will experience a step family, higher than men, uh, for whatever reason. I don't know the reason behind that. But I think I read, are more, there are more women and men, there are men in the world? Uh, small, uh, by, by like 2%, but. It's probably like the right statistic. Yeah. Asada wants to know what, what language are we going to teach Noah? Well, he's, I think he's going to learn it all. I don't know. I'm trying, yeah. I, I'm well, listen, I got to be honest. I only know some French. The The elders in my family speak French. Uh, I should say Creole. It's a broken French. Yeah. I only know certain things. I don't know enough to teach Noah. Perhaps, perhaps I should learn it. We're, we're obviously going to teach him English. That's, I'm, I'm pretty fluent in that. Um, <laughs> yes, we're going to teach him both. Absolutely. He's going to be a multilingual child. Yeah. Multilingual, multicultural, everything. So, so given all the statistics I just gave, um, talk about the challenges of living in a, a, a multicultural situation. Ideally, at my first marriage was almost like an arranged marriage um, because when you are living in Texas, Louisiana area and you are considered Creole, you are supposed to marry Creole. And this may shock people, but you know, right now it's back when I was young. It's not so much that way now, but the Creole people had to marry, yes. And so when I married uh, my first wife, I had to be approved, right? for that marriage. Otherwise, it wasn't going to happen. Uh, so my last name was good. My last name is considered a French name. Roy is pronounced Roy en Francais. Um, her last name was Olivier, French name. My relatives were, um, um, I'm sorry, like <laughs> the Ricards. It's not pronounced Ricard, it's Ricards. And Malvo's so the lineage was there. And so I was good. But, you know, we were too young to get married and it didn't work out. We had a, a beautiful son. He's great. He's 29 years old, turning 30 this year. And he is marrying a Creole uh, young lady. So he, he's kept that tradition going. And I hope it works out. Um, but my point is, that's, again, I came out of that experience. I'm not judging it. I'm not, saying it's, I'm not saying it's right. I'm not saying it's wrong. That's just the way it was. So here we are of two different cultures. It would have been easy to find uh, uh, someone of your same culture, right? Yeah. You know, in my culture, so I talk about it. In traditions as well. You know, Say again? In, some, in my culture is too as well. They practice the same traditions. Um, and some, it's almost, it derives out of uh, tribalism. You know, they have to marry within, and then it kind of, it, 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 it dates back to that, and so that you can, and if you're marrying outside of your tribe, you are marrying to acquire wealth, and so it's all about status and wealth, and so how you're going to gain wealth and status within that, and um, you only marry within that culture. So as people obviously started to immigrate, and you know, Borders happened, wars happened, all that stuff happened. So people started to in integrate and have more diversity um, within that region as well. But in our in our religion, it is um, it is so you're supposed to marry outside of your race. Culturally, they don't, and and some do, some don't. But it's not it's not very common. Um, like I said, it, it derives from that tribal tribalism um, mentality. But in our scenario, it is very, I think it's very unique to us. I don't know if there's any Creole Middle Eastern mix. <laughs> if there is, let me know, because I don't know. <laughs> uh, hey, listen, Asada, I picked up on the crown. Uh, Roth means king. Yes, it does. Um, I picked up on that. But yeah, I don't know. So we had, you know, you have your food, 
Yeah. I have my food. A staple of the Creole diet is gumbo, right? Yeah. And obviously, I've made gumbo for you. I've made etouffee for you. Um, <laughs> um, I, I make, you know, we have a certain way we make our beans and rice. Yeah. Um, her husband is half Syrian, half Indonesian. That's an interesting mix. Yeah, that's wow. it's common. It's very common, you know, um, people... They, you know, Indonesian and the Philippines, they like to come to the Middle East and look for jobs. And so that happens as well. They fall in love with yeah. the partners they can find there. I mean, I experienced that in Jordan a lot. A lot of people um, like from the Philippines would come to Jordan to work and then they would find partners there like Jordanians and then they would just marry each other. And that would happen, you know, just work opportunities and um, just, you know, whatever, you know, they just sometimes mm. work happen and for example, like Jordan was a um, a neutral country, so they would take in, yep. you know, uh, immigrants. So I've seen a lot of a lot of like. So Diana, Diana said her her mom was Christian, her dad's Muslim. Yeah. So that's interesting. Yeah. They met in Brooklyn. Of course, they met in Brooklyn. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So so talk about so talk about how you had to learn how to cook Creole food though. Yes, I, first of all, I <laughs> have to use your seasoning. <laughs> yes, you have to use my seasoning. And, <laughs> and I'm not say, like, I didn't know what seasoning was, but here's the thing. Your seasoning that you introduced me to is, it was like in combination of all the seasonings that I was, I was using already, but I was using them in individual, like, you know, packets or whatever, or bottle containers. And that one just comes in one and it was just like, oh, that's good. And Tony's hair is grease. I, sh I just did a commercial for Tony's. Um, yeah, it's it's really good <laughs> seasoning. Uh, yeah. I love it. Got to have it in, yeah. in, in my food. Uh, yeah. So, you know, because when we first began cooking for one another, um, that, that was, you know, something we had to talk about, right? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> yes, I had to learn how to cook to your tasting and to your liking because you obviously are used to some sort of taste. And then, okay, you know what? And your curveball, you have a specific diet too. <laughs> I was like, that's, that was also a curveball, but I think we're good. We're good what, was, what does that mean? Hang on. <laughs> that you have a gluten allergy. And oh, yes, I do. Red meat. So it was, that, that was like. Yes, I am a bad, I am a bad Creole because I don't eat. I don't eat any red meat. Yeah. Of course, I don't eat pork, yeah. but uh, I just don't. Yeah. And I can't eat flour because I have a gluten intolerance. So I'm just. It was just. It was. It I, was like, I cannot eat in New Orleans. And that. It was just like a combination of both. And it was, it was kind of. Yeah. But we got there. Um, definitely has to adjust to your seasoning, which I love. I am not. I'm grateful for that. Um, but my, the, we cook what I would cook, like what I know is more, they're more traditional foods. So when people think like Middle Eastern food, they think of like shish kebab and rice and salad. And that's typically not what we would eat in our households. I mean, maybe we would eat it like if we're doing, or if we're having a barbecue in this during the summertime, we'll cook it. But it's not something that we are considering this as a traditional meal and we, we would cook it every night. And each country in the Middle East has their own specific dish. So the Jordanians, they have um, their traditional dish is called the mansaf. And I am pretty sure the Palestinians is matluba. So they're two different dishes. Um, and so what we cook, like stuffed grape leaves and stuffed squash and um, luchia and just all sorts of traditional foods that are you can't really go out and to a Middle Eastern restaurant and get them, you know, traditionally. Yeah, so. you know, it's interesting. Um, my mother grew up in Opelousas, Louisiana. My father is from Bowbridge, and you would think that gumbo is the same everywhere, but it's not. Gumbo is different mm -hmm. depending on where you grew up in Louisiana. Yeah, because I had it. It, yeah, it, it, so the way my mom makes it 
is not necessarily the way my dad's family made it. And so, of course, he had to. You're not going to tell a Creole woman she has to change how she makes food, <laughs> her gumbo. That's just not going to happen. Okay. <laughs> he has to, he has to, you know, it was, she makes great gumbo, so it wasn't anything to get used to. Uh, but, <laughs> but um, you know, amazing gumbo. And so, so but the, the point, point I'm making is there's some parts of Louisiana I will not eat their gumbo because it's not good. Yeah, I, it, the things they put in it are things I wouldn't eat. Yeah. I'm not going to say what they put in it. It's just, yeah. it's to me, it's not gumbo. It's not what I grew up on. So, but to them it is. So you go to places where, um, you know, the population is like below a thousand <laughs> in Louisiana. I'm not eating their gumbo because it's it's uh, I don't know. Yeah, it's, it's different. Ours. Like there's. I mean, obviously everybody is biased to their mom's cooking. You know, everybody thinks their mom's food cooking is the best, but there are some places that they try to make perhaps a traditional dish and they don't know how to make it because that's not their traditional dish. They just, yeah. it's like me looking up a recipe for, you know, a random recipe and trying to make it. Um, and it's not, and you know, and you know, obviously in your culture too, cooking comes like it's an experience, right? It comes yeah. from the heart, it comes from like you feel it. You, yeah. you, there's no measuring cups, there's no, you know what I mean? It's just, it's something that you just experience and that's how the dish is made and that's how it's made out, out of. So if I'm just reading a recipe and I don't know it, I don't know how it's supposed to taste too, it's just not gonna taste well. Let's talk about uh, the age difference. Yeah. And <laughs> People probably didn't realize this, but I'm older than you are. Man, I thought I was like getting wrinkly. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> so, talk about that challenges around the age I difference. I don't know if there's any challenges. I don't think. I don't know. I mean, pre like me introducing you to Twitter, I think that was like. <laughs> <laughs> because, okay. Because it was like I just did. She just call me old. <laughs> no, you I just, think she did. You just weren't on Twitter, and I would just like talk to you and reference Twitter, and I would tell you like, oh my god, like things happen on Twitter, like yeah. real time, and yeah. you don't know about it. Yeah, you're the reason I'm doing this right now. You're the reason I'm on Instagram. I'm yeah. posting. I'm looking at followers. I'm worried about the likes now. <laughs> <laughs> you know. <laughs> Three, four years ago, I could care less about this stuff. And I thought people who did it were weird. And now, here I am. So, here's so that's, that's your influence on me. <laughs> so the whole thing with social media, there's two ways to use it. There's, you know, there's a good way, there's a destructive way, you know, perhaps. To You're use avoiding it. the question. Um, I, I didn't say, I answered it. I said, I don't think there is a problem between our age group. I don't feel like there's an age group. I didn't say a problem, okay. but... Are there like some obvious differences and challenges or things that come up? Okay, you're like I said, you're the reason I'm on. I, I admit it. You're the reason I'm on Instagram. You're the reason I tweet now and live for the followers. So, <laughs> what has been my influence on you, if any? Oh my gosh, yes. Like, okay, so you're asking that question that way. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Let me ask. Let me ask it that way. I mean just so much you've helped me uh, a lot and um i think you ground me in so many ways you know i tend to be um, like you know when we first when i first gave birth you know i was so um, anxious all the time and i just had all this anxiety and uh, and I, I was always in like fight or flight mode like oh my god is he breathing is he breathing kind of like just that's just continuously that was the status I was in and you were there to help me just and I would go and I was happening and you're just like it's he going to be okay he's okay and you were just always like um you know comfort me and ground me and the sound of reason always in my head always and I really appreciate that about you um you're just always the voice of reason and I think that is just something that um, so thankful for in our relationship. <laughs> or you. I think she called me old again. How big of an age difference someone said? 
Oh, wow. Um, <laughs> well, 18 and a half years. 18, 18 and a half years. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I don't think that, I don't think that we feel it. I don't think that we, I go, I don't, there's, I don't know, but I don't feel like, oh my God, like there is a huge gap difference. I think that like somebody said, we balance each other out. But I think that we are always going to just, you know, and there's some, some days that where I have to be the voice of reason to you as well. <laughs> and, so, and so I think we did find a perfect match and I think we found each other at the right time in our lives as well too. I think, um, you know, if we met when I was perhaps a little younger, we were a little younger, I don't think we would have kind of came together into our relationship, but I think we met at a, at a really good time. And I am so thankful that I am on this journey with you because you really are a great husband. You're a really great father. I mean, you just... You, you're going to make me cry. <laughs> well, awesome. thank you. And, you. and you are a great mother. Um, and, and listen, yeah, you are. And so my mommy's post is really an expression of that, right? Yeah. So you, you, it ex you express it through your posts, through the effort you put into it. And the reason people don't know, uh, that you started my mommy's post is because you wanted to be a, be a great mom, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. And you wanted to help other mothers be a great mom. And so I, th I think by virtue of that, that, you know, speaks volumes of, of how great a mother you are. So, and so, and just so everyone knows, yeah, this is number five for me. It's number one for me. <laughs> it's number one, number one for Sundos, number five for me. And so, yeah, you know, so when things would happen, I'd be like, okay, yeah. Yeah, you were. And it's going to be okay. <laughs> I think, honestly, like if I had another partner, like, if this was both of our like first son and I was like, oh, like how I was like always in like this anxiety driven environment, I think it would have been just a nightmare. I think I would have been in a different mental state of mind. I think I would have been in like just a different person as a mom, you know, because, um, you know, and especially like postpartum moms have to deal with a lot of emotions. And yeah. on top of that, I was dealing with, which I later figured out through my posting is that there is such thing as postpartum anxiety so we focus about on postpartum depression and baby mm -hmm. blues but nobody talks about postpartum anxiety and that's what i was experiencing i i was experiencing postpartum anxiety and it's real it's there it happened to me but you really helped me get through that and i always talk about this and you know i've talked about this in my youtube videos as well like how you were able to help me just navigate through that part and especially in that time of year at that particular time I was going through things that were you know I was still going through grief and losing my sister and just a lot of life changing changes were happening at that time and being pregnant and giving birth so I really was so anxious and, and I thought I was going to be dealing with you know postpartum depression so you really helped me through that. of course um, we had uh, Karen Karen said there's an age gap of 13 years with her boyfriend. Right, Karen? Got it. <laughs> yeah, it is. It's really, it, it, and it's not for- What questions, but let's see if they have any questions for us because uh, we, our relationship is so unique in so many ways. There, There is the age difference. There, there are the cultural differences, um, right? And you know, like we the uniqueness of the cultures. Life, what? Was huh? We lived like you lived in Texas, for example, and I really don't know the Texas culture. In LA. You know. Do you we, celebrate both religions? Is the question. Um, what is that? Hmm? What does that mean? Do you mean like do we celebrate the holidays? Yes, yeah, so we celebrate we, we celebrate both holidays. Um, if that is the question, 
Yes. So I have to, uh, yeah, I, I, um, I fast <laughs> with Sundos. <laughs> That's been tough for me. Fasting uh, has been tough for me. It's something um, I think had I uh, done it from a child, which, which Noah will do, right? It becomes cyclical. It becomes, your body gets accustomed to it. It's yeah. just like, it's analogous to, um, I'm going to bring up gumbo again. Not, I, I, because it's like a clock goes off in your head and you think, oh, it's time to make gumbo. Mm -hmm. So it's this cyclical thing that happens, right? And, I, you know, for me, it's like I'm trying to, to, to get used to it. But it's, it's, fasting is tough for me. Yeah, I mean, I've been fasting. We, you know, we try to fast early, like at nine, ten years old, and we'll do like half a day when they're younger. And into, like, you'll start introduce the children to fasting as as much as they can tolerate it. You know, we do half a day, whatever. So I've been, or I, from my memory of fasting, was like nine, ten years old. So I've been doing it for pretty much half of my life. I'm gonna follow your lead on that because I don't know when to start or how to I, do it. Yeah, so. I know. And for you, you started, you know. This, this in my age. advanced age and, yeah and i it is i honestly i was so proud of you i was so proud of you because there's some days that i thought like wow how is he even fasting <laughs> and you were really you did a really good job i'm so proud of you <laughs> well thank you very much <laughs> let's see what uh different upbringings exactly what other questions you guys have for us yeah i i think that brings i Honestly, like, I think that, you know, and we talked about this, like, about diversity and, like, the climate that we're in right now with, like, our country. I think the more that we integrate with one another and we understand one another, I think there's more similarities than there are differences that we believe, that we are, you know, subject to believing, you know. And we kind of talked about this last night or two nights ago on the dinner table. And I said, you know, um, in this in this era, in this generation, when you think of like a Middle Eastern person, we were just so programmed to think, you know, terrorist, bomber, extremist, Sharia law, like you have these things programmed in you, you know, and so you have this deterrence as an American to go like, oh no, we don't, you know, they're this type of person. And the stereotype for a black man, and you have all these stereotypes, you know, when you, when you say black man, and you have all these stereotypes that run through your head. And I think once we break these stereotypes and like he suggested to just go and talk to somebody that does not look like you or does not come from your background you will then find out that you have more similarities than there are differences and that's just the american culture that we, are. That's our environment. You know? we got a question do you have similar temperaments what advice do you have for those who don't uh what would you, how would you answer that question? That's a great question. Do we have similar temperaments? Um, so. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think. <laughs> okay, explain yourself. <laughs> explain yourself right now. Okay. Is, there, is everybody reading between the lines right now? <laughs> Okay. You're right. You're right. Go ahead. Go ahead. I don't. Here's the thing. I have a lot of patience. I'm very understanding. I have. Wait, wait, wait. Time out. Did you guys hear that? I have a lot of patience. <laughs> what does that mean? <laughs> okay, she's serious. Let's answer the question. So. <laughs> I don't know. I'm, I guess I'm the a-hole in, in the relationship. I don't know. No, we have a great relationship. Um, and I think that I'm at a point in my life where I, had, I just have a whole lot more patience. And, I, and again, that's not a, a shot at you. I just have a lot more patience because what I mean by that is when you have two people coming together, who, where there's an age difference, where there are cultural differences, there are going to be conflicts. Mm -hmm. and, and there's going to be compromise. Yeah. And you can't get bent out of shape over things. You can't personalize things. Yeah. You know, when your spouse or significant other comes at you with, you know, ah, with anger or something, it's not about that moment. 
It's about something else. So you need to stop and say, okay, let me figure out what's really going on uh, with the situation. It, it's not because I took the last, you know, Snickers. Um, it's because, you know, whatever, I'm just making something up. It's not because I ate the last Popsicle. That's a real one. It's because <laughs> of something else that has happened. Uh, and, and, and we need to talk about it. First of all, never go to bed angry. Yes. Okay. Always talk things out. Compromise is not easy. You're right. Compromise is not easy. Um, but it, someone in the relationship, uh, let me, I'll finish it and you go. Someone in the relationship has to compromise more than the other. And I'm sorry, that's just the way it is because our personalities are not the same. And so someone has to lead by example with respect to compromise and it will you know, begin to rub off on the other person. But you, you have to demand what you want in the relationship. Go ahead. Yeah, and, I, and honestly, like, although you say, I agree with you, there has to be one person that has to compromise. But at the same time, the person that's compromising needs to understand not to let go of themselves. So they don't become a walking doormat. That's know? correct. They also have to set standards for themselves as well. They have to say, like, listen, I understand you're having a bad day. You know, let's talk about it. Let's, you know, what did we do? What did I? What, what can we do differently? But in order for that that moment to to kind of move on and just move forward with that, but not to go like, oh, it's okay. It's, you disrespected me, for example, for example. And I'm gonna say like, no, it's okay. You can you can do it. And, and kind of dismiss it, but not address it because now you're gonna do it again. And that for me now, I'm, you know, I'm kind of resenting that secretly because I don't want to talk about it. Find a lid to your pot. Yeah, that's a great one. Um, there's so much wisdom in our grandparents, right, or the elders in our family. Um, yeah, I, I think, though, you, you have to start with the premise that this is a person I love, the person I want to spend the rest of my life with. If you start with that premise, let that guide your actions and behavior from there. If you decide at some point that do I really want to be with this person? If those thoughts cross your mind, you might be in trouble. Because what will start to happen is those little things that, that eat at you will become bigger things and bigger things and bigger things. So you have to, again, if this is a person you want to spend the rest of your life with and you love this person with everything, you've got to keep that at the forefront of your mind, okay? And, and do everything within the context of that. Does that make sense? So none of us are perfect people, but we are imperfectly perfect for the person that we with. If that person loves us, if that person loves us and we love them, right? Yeah, it only, it only works in a, in a relationship where there's two people that love each other. If there's one person that's compromising all and they're just kind of putting in everything into the pot and the other person is not contributing then at, at one at some point this person is going to be exhausted and they're going to stop contributing and then they're and then that relationship will wither within a within a, a second because yeah. there's only one person contributing to that relationship yeah and, and and we have our moments i mean we're not we're not perfect yeah we have our moments and, and we work through them and but the rule is don't go to bed angry and and so we go from being being upset with one another to laughing. Laughter has to end the moment, right? Yeah. Right? She's thinking about yesterday, I think. <laughs> Laughter has to end the moment. It cannot end with anger. Yeah. And, um, and that ex that laughter is an expression of your love. Yeah. And that that comes with growth from both parties. Like there's a lot of things that I do with you that I wouldn't, I wouldn't have done like four years ago, for example, like I would never like, like sit down and apologize, talk about it. So I think that's something that, you know, it comes with maturity, it comes with wanting to fix the relationship because you love this person, you want to be with them and you think that they deserve that. And so although you're angry, you know, you still want to talk about it and figure it out. The other thing I would say is also the thing that drives you most crazy about your significant other. I'm going to ask you to do an exercise, everyone, and it's going to be very difficult. The thing that drives you most crazy about your significant other, try to find the value in it. 
try to find the value in it. Try to understand that thing has value and what is that value? Okay, I, I know someone said he's too calm. What's the value in having someone who's calm? Yeah. Particularly in stressful situations or situations where everyone is excited and, and, and anxiety ridden. There's value in that kind of person, right? So again, the thing that drives you most crazy, you've got to program your mind and associate that with something positive. Okay, associate that with something positive. And then you'll begin to appreciate that person more, mm -hmm. if that makes sense. So everyone try that exercise, okay? After you get off this, this IG Live, um, <laughs> go and thank that person for being that way. And, and again, find a positive slant to that. Yeah. I right? Think also what we I do it with you all the time. Yeah, I know. <laughs> No. <laughs> um, I think also, yeah, is that you, um, as as I you know grow into a relationship as well, I feel like it is also very important to tell your, to tell your partner periodically, unexpectedly, un unplanned, that how much you appreciate them. Just so, kind of just like what we did earlier, um, mm -hmm. you know, we sometimes do that all the time. You know, it's not something that just just because we're on the live, we do it. You know, we, we've said that those things yeah. to one another. We we also say it, you know, sporadically, periodically, whatever it is. And we go, you know what? I, you know, appreciate this, this, and that about you. So thank you. I love you. You know, and so that kind of almost like checks the relationship, especially when you're going through so the motions of life. Um, you know, it's you know the family and life and work and all this craziness that comes. And, and you're just mentally exhausted, you're mentally tired, and then you lean on to your partner, and your partner tells you, you know, you're doing a good job, you're a great husband, you're a great, you know, I love you, you, you know, you're great to me, whatever it is, that kind of just checks everything into back into place, and then just gives you that, it's almost like a refresh. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. I think it's also important. I think that is important. You, you have to want to do that. If you struggle to do that for your partner, you got to reexamine the relationship. You know, you really have to. And again, someone's got to lead by example. Um, any more questions? We are uh, almost out of time on our, our live. So everybody mark, mark this day in time. And a year from now, we're, <laughs> we're going to do a live. And hopefully we'll be saying the same things that we're saying today, right? <laughs> you know what? We'll be saying. It's going to be recorded. <laughs> We'll be doing divorce court or something. I don't know. Uh, of course. That's a joke. That's a joke. We'd be hosting um, court. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I, think, I think everyone sees how authentic we are. This, we're not putting on airs. You know, uh, this is who we are and this is our relationship. Um, so, and I think everyone can see that coming through, even on the screen. And, and just so I know we can be kind of like, we went through past relationships in order for us to become this person for one and another. So it's not like we just, you know, woke up one day and we're like, oh, I'm looking for somebody to spend the rest of my life with. And we found each other and that was it. Like we are also, we're a work in progress to this point and we still are. So although you might see that we are, we find this, like we found our rhythm in our relationship. Also there, there is flaws as well into our relationships, but we also, I'm saying also a lot. Um, we are all, you know, we have been working on ourselves. So I think that's very important. You need to work on yourself. You need to work on yourself together with your partner. You know, you got, you guys both have to work on each other together. And I think that is um, very helpful. Oh, that's very nice of you to say. Very nice of you to say. Um, and I'll just say one more thing um, about that. And I just lost my thought, just like that. You see that? There's that age difference. <laughs> um, okay. Any other thoughts or questions before we let you guys go? I had something very profound I was going to say. What are we looking at? People. Let's do it. 
In fact, my great-great-grandfather was a German soldier. Can you believe that? He's a what? He was a German soldier. My great-great-grandfather. Yeah, yeah. Anyway, thanks everyone for joining uh, the live tonight. And we, as we discussed, our blended family and our blended cultures. Can't wait to see me dance. Oh no, I can't dance on these old on these anymore. <laughs> um, no, no, no. Um, anyway, <laughs> thanks everyone. Uh, we'll be back next Monday. And we're going to keep the same topic going. And we'll have some more things to, t to talk about and discuss, discuss. And if we can give advice on relationships, we'll offer it. We're not experts, uh, but we failed enough in this to know what not to do. Yes. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. All right. Take care, everyone. Have Bye a good yeah. night. Thanks for joining us.